Amen. Have you, have you ever stopped to consider just how amazing the Bible is? I mean, how amazing God's Word is. Actually, 66 books, a collection of books that God has given us with, with so many different types of literature contained in there with, with, with history and law and poetry, you know, prophecy, letters, you know, apocrypha literature. Such a, a, a diverse, amazing book that God has given us, who he inspired with his Holy Spirit about 40 different authors over a period of over 1,500 years. And yet God has miraculously brought all of this together in his word. What an amazing book. But you know what? The, the most amazing thing about the Bible is, is the Bible has literally, literally transformed billions of people's lives. You know, McDonald's now boasts about selling billions of, of hamburgers, and I, I guess that's a, that's a big deal. You know, they started with the exact number, and then they couldn't keep up, so it became millions, and now it's up to, to billions. So I'm, I'm, I'm selling hamburgers it is significant, okay? But the Bible has literally transformed, changed billions of people's lives. Think about the number of lives that have been transformed by God's Word. People have literally gone from, from death, spiritual death, to life because of the impact of God's Word. People have gone from, from being utterly hopeless to having purpose, having meaning, having hope in their lives because of God's Word. Right? There are people who are, who are living lives of, of loneliness and isolation yet because of God's word have been brought into a life of, of community and relationship. Marriages have been rescued. Marriages on the brink of divorce have been rescued because of the power of God's word, right? Addicts have been set free from their addictions because of God's word. People who were living idle lives, just idle lives with nothing going on, suddenly have purpose and meaning because of the impact of God's word. People have gone from guilty, from being consumed with their guilt and their sin, to being forgiven and set free because of the impact of God's word. People have gone from being depressed to being people who are full of joy because of the impact of God's word. You know, it's a reminder of Psalm 119, 105, which says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, right, and a, a light to my path. So literally the picture is God's word, the Bible, the scriptures, right, showing us the steps of our lives to take. That's why Paul writes to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, and he says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable or useful Right, for, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete or mature, equipped for every good work. That's a picture of the scriptures being impactful, of being transformative, of having the power to change us. Maybe my, my favorite reference in scripture to scripture is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where the author there says, For the word of God is living and active. What a picture. It's not a stale old book. Yes, it, it was written over, over 1,500 years, so that there's portions of it that are very old. All of it is at least you know, a couple thousand years old. So there's that. But even still, it is alive. It is active. It is still impactful. He goes on to say, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Have you ever considered that as you read the scripture? Because like, like Paul was writing, because somebody was accusing him of, of having poor motives, right? And Paul writes back and says, I, I don't even understand my own motives, so I, I can't really speak to that, right? Well, here the scripture is saying, well, the word of God understands our motives. The, the word of God can reveal to us what is going on in our heart. That is the power of the word of God to transform us, to change us. 
Well, today we're, we're in the book of Nehemiah, and we're in chapter 8, and we're going to see a snapshot, a picture of, of how hearing the Word of God read impacted, transformed a group of people as they were reestablishing themselves in the city of Jerusalem. So if you have a copy of the Scriptures, turn to, to Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll begin in verses 1 through 6. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early in the morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matiahiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malshajai, Mashum and Hashbadinani, Zechariah and Mashulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he, appeared, and he opened it all the pe- as all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered him, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So the first thing that kind of sticks out as we read this passage together, or maybe the second thing, because the first thing that I thought of is I should have had Phil or Alex read this morning. But the the second thing that kind of sticks out in this passage is that the word transforms when we listen. When we attentively listen to the word of God, it has the power to impact their lives. Again, verse 1 says, And they they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So who is this they that's asking that the law, that Ezra bring out the law and read it to him? It it, it is the people. The people are asking for it. This is not Ezra saying, now quiet down. Listen, I'm about to read the word of the, the Lord. So everybody be quiet. That's not what's happening. This is the people saying, Ezra, get the scriptures, get the scrolls. We want to hear it. We want to listen to it. We want to hear what it says. So the people are asking for the opportunity to hear, to listen to the word of God. Verse 1 says, they gathered as one man. In other words, all of these people from all of these different backgrounds, men and women and children, all there together, but, but it's as if they're one. Because they're all unified now under the same authority. They're all saying, we want to place ourselves under the authority of the word of God. So we we are unified in that. We are all under that same umbrella, that same authority of God's word. And notice where they did it. It says they did it into the square before the water gate. So this is not in the temple. So there are no restrictions. Right in the temple, you've got places that men can go and places that women can go and places that others can go. But here at the water gate, he's saying, anybody that has the ability to understand, come and listen, come and hear. And so they listened. And they listened because they were hungry for it. They desired to hear the Word of God. They had been in exile for so long where where opportunities to hear the Word of God was limited, right? So they're not listening because suddenly, you know, Ezra's some dynamic speaker, right? They're, They're not listening based on, I hear Ezra's got a great sense of humor. Let's go hear him. He's funny. That's not what's happening here, Right? They're, not, they're, not, they're not going to listen because there's a, a celebrity with some inspirational testimony. No, they are listening because they are hungry for the Word of God. Ezra, the speaker that day, he didn't have to work hard to keep their attention. He's simply reading the Word of God, and the people are listening. They want to hear. Listen to how long he reads. It says he read, verse 3, from early morning until midday. And there's no hint 
that the, the people got bored. Why? Because they were hungry for it. They wanted to hear it. They were, they were experiencing a buffet of God's word, and, and they couldn't get enough. Right? Have you ever had like a, a, a late breakfast, and so you're, you're a little bit full, and then a friend calls you and says, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And you're like, eh, okay. And they're like, oh, great, because there's this new buffet I've been wanting to try out. And you're like, oh, great. That's the last thing you wanted, right? You don't want a buffet because you're, like, you're already filled up with other stuff. Right, but these people are hungry. They can't get enough. They have, they have been without God's word in exile for so long. They are hungry to know the words of God. They are hungry to know the scripture. They are hearing God's word and they are realizing what it is that they've been missing. Verse 4 says, And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform. Some people have described this as somewhat of a, of a turning point in, in the history of worship. Temple worship was a beautiful thing, and they did it as prescribed by God. So it was beautiful, and it was majestic, and it was overwhelming with, with the presence of God. But here, they've simply got the Word of God. They've simply got Scripture being read. So for the first time, the Word of God, Scripture, is taking not just a place in their worship experience, but it's really taking center stage. And the reaction of the people, it, it wasn't like sometimes people are tempted to do, to, to make a relic out of it. Oh, that was so powerful. That was so wonderful. Let's, let's, let's put that scroll in a case and, and frame it, and maybe people can come and look at it. That's not what they did. But what they did was they experienced, as they heard the words of God spoken, they experienced genuine worship. They saw the word of God pointing to the truth about the one true God. You see, the word of God, the scripture, led them to genuinely worship their creator. Verse 4 says, In the ears of all the people, were attentive to the book of the law. So the ears were attentive. The, they were doing the hard work of listening. They wanted to soak in God's words. They're, they're not listening passively. right? They're, they're not listening as if from a distance. They're, they're leaning forward. They want to hear these words of God that Ezra is reading. They're not saying, you know, Ezra, okay, impress us, Ezra. You know, speak to us in a way that can hold our attention for hours. No, they understand their responsibility to be active listeners. And it's not as if they're, they're hearing some, some new teaching, some new exciting theory on something. What they're hearing is the book of Moses. Right now, the book of Moses was penned by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in around 1450. Ezra is reading this to the people in the year 430 B.C. So a thousand years have passed since Moses wrote down these words to when now Ezra is reading them to the people. And yet they're hungry to hear these ancient words. They understood their responsibility in this. They understood that the word of God was being spoken, so they had a responsibility to listen intently, to be active listeners. And look at what verse 5 says. It says, as he opened it, all the people stood. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons they're listening so intently is because they have a reverence for God's word. They revere God's word. They understood that these are the words of God. And so they want to receive these words into their lives. So God is speaking and they want to listen because they understand what is being spoken to be the very words of God. Now, now, standing up is descriptive. That, that's, that's Nehemiah describing what they did. Their way of expressing their reverence to the word of God was to stand. Right? That, that doesn't mean that, that every time God's word is read, if we don't stand, that we don't revere it. That, is, that was their method. Right? Standing every time the word of God is spoken could be just as, as complacent right? and just as passive as not standing. The point is to show the picture that they had a reverence for it. What is prescriptive, right? What is, what is commanded is the reverence for God's word, the attention to it, the listening to it, the taking it seriously. Look at the people's response in verse 6. All the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord 
with their faces to the ground. So their, their response was, was vocal and physical. They, they didn't hold it in. They said, amen, amen. And they, they lifted up their hands as an expression of, yes, God, we need you. We're, we're hearing your words, and we understand that, that we need you. We need your help. We need transformation. We need change in our lives. Verse 6 says, And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So their response to hearing the word of God was humility. Their response was worshipful. Their response was acknowledging the greatness of God and the smallness of themselves in comparison. So we have to ask ourselves the question, has God's word, has the scriptures impacted you in that way? And if you've never had that experience, if you've never heard the word of God or read the word of God or or heard the word of God preaching and had a response like that, then, then maybe we all need to ask ourselves the question, how active of a listener am I? How hungry for the word of God am I? You know, many of you are so kind. And so, so encouraging. You know, one thing I, I hear sometimes that as you are, are walking out, people will, will stop and say, hey, thanks for preparing the message today. And, you know, I, I don't usually do this, but I think after, after this, maybe the, the proper response to that is, well, thank you for preparing to hear. Thank you for preparing yourself to listen. Because it, it seems like the most important thing in whether or not the Word of God impacts you is, have I prepared myself, have I prepared my heart to hear what God has to say to me today? Have I come in with with open hands saying, God, whatever your word wants to do in my life and my heart, however your word wants to transform me and change me today, I am open for it. So the reason that the people were impacted was because they were listening the other reason is, the other reason the word transforms is, it, it transforms when we understand. In other words, when we understand the word of God, it will change us, it will transform us. Look at verse 7 and 8. It says, also, Jeshua, Bane, Sherbae, Jaman, Akab, Shabbatiah, Hodiah, Messiah, Kilta, Azirah, Josaban, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book and from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So the, the, these 13 Levites came down into the crowd and began to help the people understand what Ezra was reading. They came down and began to explain what it was that Ezra was reading to them. They're fulfilling what what the law told them to do in in Deuteronomy 33.10, which says, they shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. Now, in in this context, right, there there were people who had never heard the word, right? It had been hundreds of years since they had all been together in Jerusalem. So undoubtedly, there would be be many who would be unfamiliar with it. So they're they're kind of starting with the idea that that, that there's some basic understanding that you might need to have in order to understand what God's word is saying. Of course, there were some who didn't even speak Hebrew, right? Aramaic had become a common language in the day. So many only spoke Aramaic. So they would literally have to go and tell them, okay, Ezra's reading in the Hebrew language, but here's what he's saying in your language. So the Levites went down among the people to make sure that the people understood what the word of God was saying. They helped them to understand. You know, if we're, if we're if we're honest and if we're real and if we open our eyes to what's happening in our society, more and more we live in a biblically illiterate society. So what does that mean? That means that we have a responsibility, right, to teach people in a way that they understand, to teach people where they're at in their understanding. You can no longer just assume a basic biblical understanding from people. If you're going to teach people God's word, you have to assume that they may have to start at the very beginning, which means we need to be patient, which means we need to meet people at the level of their understanding. So, which means teaching people in a setting like this, where where many people from a variety of backgrounds are gathered, is essential, 
right? It gives us an opportunity to, to teach at different levels. It gives us an opportunity. Sometimes maybe when you're here in a crowd of people, you don't understand, but it gives you the opportunity to say, you know, there's some things that I don't understand. There's some things that I need to learn. Right, but it also gives us the opportunity to remember that as we teach the Word of God, yeah, it may seem like, yes, I've, I've heard this, I know this, I'm familiar with this, but to remember there, there's other people that may not have that same understanding. So, so learning in a, in a setting like this is important, but also learning in a smaller group setting is important. At Northwoods, we do those at, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings as well as, as other times during the week. But that gives you the, an opportunity in a smaller setting to hear God's Word taught, right? Face-to-face -face with a teacher, we have the opportunity to, to raise a hand and say, wait, wait, what did that mean? Because I, I didn't really understand what you were saying there. Or even to, to stay after and say, hey, can, you got just a minute because you said something that I didn't fully grasp or understand. Would you take a moment and explain that to me? That's why it's important that we're learning and studying God's Word in smaller groups. And of course, it's critical that we're reading and studying and learning God's Word at home and on our own, right? Because there are resources available where we can learn and study in ways that were never possible before. But there, there's literally no limit to the amount of resources, you know, just at our, at our fingertips to learn and to study God's Word. But it's crucial. The thing that, that transformed the, these men and women and children in Israel was that they listened, they heard, but also the Levites made sure that they understood the Word of God. You see, the, the Word of God is not magic. It's not, you know, abacadabra, whatever that means. But, you know, when the, when the magician says that, he can now pull a rabbit out of his hat, right? How, do, how does he do that? Well, that's, that's an illusion. That's a trick. That's magic. But the Word of God's not like that. It's not like we read it and somehow magically we're transformed. No, the Word of God happens when we understand it. And the Holy Spirit takes that and convicts our heart and begins to transform our lives. So it's critically important that we don't just hear the Word of God but we learn it, that we study it, and that we understand it. And then finally, the Word of God transforms us when we obey it. Look at verse 9 through 12. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So verse 9 again says, this, is, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. You see, God's word had led them to repentance. God's word had led them to change their minds about their lives. As they heard God's word, it wasn't hard for them to compare what they're hearing, how God told them they should be living their lives, and then compare that to how they were actually living their lives. And the result of that was conviction. The result of that was grief over their sin. They were convicted by the difference between their lives and the way God had instructed them. It reminds you of, of James chapter 1, verse 23 through 24, when he says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. In other words, he's saying that the, the Word of God is intended to be a mirror. It's intended to show us how we are, not just to ignore, but to make the necessary changes. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, and that, that word confess means to see it the same way as. So when we read God's Word, when we read the Scriptures, it, it should help us to see 
our lives and our sin the way that God does. Right? It should help us to see that God sees our sin as being painful to ourselves and others. Right? God sees our sin as being devastating to his creation. God sees our sin as what separates us from him. Right? God sees our sin as what causes pain in our relationships with one another. Right? When, when God sees our sin, he sees what sent his son Jesus to the cross. So John says, if we confess our sins, in other words, when we see our sin the same way that God sees it, when we understand that, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, John is telling them and the, the, the Levites and others are telling the people in Jerusalem, you don't have to dwell in your guilt. Yes, God has convicted you, but now God is lifting you up. Right now that there's been confession, there is forgiveness. And in forgiveness, there is joy, there is gladness, there is happiness. So Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites, they're saying, this is a day to rejoice. This is a day to be happy. Your sins are forgiven. God is restoring Jerusalem. God is restoring your lives. God is putting everything back together again. So verse 10 says, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if the joy of the Lord is our strength, what is the joy of the Lord? You know what the joy of the Lord is in this context? It's providing for your forgiveness. God delights in restoring you into a right relationship with himself and with others. That's why Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What's he saying? What, what enabled Jesus, even as he's being nailed to a cross, right? And they told him, you know, you're the son of God, step down. And Jesus very well could have. He had the power to do that. He had the ability to do that. But the author of Hebrews here is telling us why he did not. And the reason that Jesus stayed on the cross, the reason that Jesus endured that suffering and even death was for the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy? That joy was knowing that God was going to be glorified in a very specific way. He was going to be glorified because Jesus was providing a way for our sins to be forgiven. Jesus was providing a way for our relationship with God, with our creator, to be restored. And so Jesus being able to look past the cross, what was on the other side of the cross, knowing that what he was doing on the cross was, was going to lead to making all things new, including our relationship with God, Jesus found joy in that. So the joy of the Lord is our strength. What is the joy of the Lord? The joy of the Lord is he finds great gladness, great joy, great happiness in restoring our relationship with him. So God's great joy is offering forgiveness. It's offering reconciliation. You know, sometimes people get stuck in, in the grief part of that restoration and the confession part of that sin when we realize what our sin is. And, and even some believers who have been believers for a long time kind of get stuck in thinking, I'm a believer, but I'm not really on the level of, of other people and we just kind of carry our past and we carry our grief and we we carry our past mistakes and our past sins along with us well what gives god great joy is saying now you are completely forgiven right you are completely you now have the righteousness of jesus himself that is what you are clothed in so you don't have to carry that grief along with you you can now be full of joy you can now be full of happiness and when the people realized that, when they were instructed that way, listen to verse 12 and what happened. It says, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So they went from grief over their sin to obedience, and the result of that was great joy it was eating it was drinking it was celebrating there was great joy and celebration in their obedience to god they were celebrating because now their lives have been transformed they've been changed
by the word of God. You know, the word of God has the power. It has the ability to transform us when we're willing to listen to it intentionally, deliberately, actively listening to the word of God. When we come to a, a setting where we know God's word is going to be spoken or taught, coming saying, God, I know your words are going to be taught and spoken, so God, use that in my life. Use your words to transform me, to change me. God's word transforms us when we, when we understand it, when we're willing to do what, yes, is sometimes admittedly difficult work, hard work work understanding God's word but when we're willing to do that with the help of the Holy Spirit it can transform us it can change us and the word transforms us when we obey it obviously like James says it does us no good if we just look at it and say yep I, I, I kind of figured no, no no when we look at it and go yes my life needs to change God help me change God with the power of your Holy Spirit transform me God I know what, what you want for me and what you want for me is to be more and more like your son Jesus so God I just pray that through your word that that process would be taking place and no that won't be easy right it, it'll be contrary it'll be contrary to your natural longings right it'll be contrary to the flesh it'll be contrary to to our culture and the way that our culture lives their lives right it'll be contrary to what you're used to how you're used to living your lives but it'll also produce great joy because that's what God wants for us he wants you to have joy, to have satisfaction of knowing that your sins are forgiven and that he is transforming and changing your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power, God, in each and every lives, for those who are willing to, to listen, for those who are willing, God, to understand and those who are willing to obey. God, your word has the power to transform us, to change us. God, to help us overcome things that we thought we would never be able to overcome. God, it will help us to, to rid our lives of things that we just assumed would always be a part of our lives, would always be just a point of pain in our lives. And yet, God, we confess today that your word and the power of your Holy Spirit can help us to overcome all of that. So, God, I pray for each one of us this morning because we all have portions and parts of our lives, God, where you're still at work, where you're still transforming us, where you're still changing us. God, I pray that you would use your word this morning to make us more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand